All Kate. right, great. Well, we got lucky in this regard that we are actually getting to talk to you before lunch. Otherwise, we might have risked everyone else having false tummies and uh, you know, a little less engagement. That said, the conversations this morning have been really interesting and really engaging. And so, you know, thank you to the Intentional Endowments Network for putting this together, to uh, the Boston Foundation for hosting us, and you know, to each one of you for showing up and spending your time today. It's really helpful. Uh, so I will provide a brief introduction, but what's interesting about this panel is we're getting to some of the questions that were the burning questions around what are people doing in the space and how. And so I'll turn it over to Eric and John to really describe that. But by way of background, my name is Kate Dumas. I'm a consultant at Prime Buckholz, and we work with clients such as the University of New Hampshire. Uh, to build out investment programs that are responsive to their unique opportunities, dynamics, um, and in some cases really aligned with their overall broad mission and values. In addition, I am the co-chair of our Mission Alliance Investment Committee. And so we work together across the firm, uh, research, client services, cross-functional, to build out the types of solutions that our clients can turn to in terms of really aligning their investments with their missions and values. And so New Hampshire Community Loan Fund is one of our recommended investments within the impact space. It's something that we had come to a couple of years ago. And it took us some time really not only to do the diligence, but also to figure out where it fit within the portfolio. And so I think as we turn it over to Eric and John, they'll touch on a lot of those things. And we'll pause and welcome your conversation and questions as well. So as it pertains to the University of New Hampshire, Eric, maybe a brief introduction. And then uh, you know, a bit of the history around sustainability and ESG at the foundation. Um, okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, so I'm Eric Gross. I'm the treasurer at the UNH Foundation. I've been there for about three and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I worked at the University System of New Hampshire, um, focusing on. Is it hard to hear? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Try it again. Try it again. Is that better? Yes. Okay. All right. Let me start over. Um, Eric Gross. I'm uh, with the University of New Hampshire Foundation. I'm the treasurer. I've been there for about three and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I was five years with the University System of New Hampshire, uh, working on their debt portfolio and their investment portfolio, um, non-personnel insurance products, and so on. And uh, so um, at UNH, UNH has a very long history of sustainability. Um, the investment space for UNH um, is probably one of the last areas of UNH to come over and actually start incorporating sustainability into its thought process. Um, UNH has uh, the Sustainability Institute. It has several majors in areas related to sustainability. Um, it is very well known for its climate uh, research. And uh, it has a, you may have heard of it, um, a student-led trash to treasure program annually. They, our students, um, recycle to, to new students. Um, furniture and other types of things. So um, they have local s sourcing for food for the dining halls. So a really strong, strong um, ethic around sustainability. Um, that ethic has not, as I said earlier, um, been reflected necessarily in the investments. Um, our investment committee historically was uh, resistant to really thinking or working about um, any, any issues related to sustainability. Um, over the last five years, however, we've moved from barely on the radar to, if we're optimistically talking about where we are today, well over on the right side. I um, would say that um, a number of the different questions that come up, I would say put us in probably the, the, a third of the way over to over on the right side. So you know, it's, it's really a work in process for us. Um, and it's a long track. Um, it takes a long time for this to, ha to ha actually happen. Um, the players are very important in the discussion. Um, the education of all of the people involved is very important in the discussion. And it's an evolution of thought um, that leads to certain actions um, over time. So um, 
if I can just briefly review the timeline for how we got to where we are. In 2012, we had a couple different student groups very interested in either divestment or socially responsible investing. Um, there were a number of uh, campus dialogues that the university president was involved with and uh, really fostered. And ultimately, in 2013, um, we, in 2014, we actually had an ESG option approved for our endowment portfolio. And we actually do now have a separate, relatively small at this point, um, ESG investment sleeve. Um, in 2013, I believe it was about that time that UNH first considered the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund's offerings in terms of um, how it might um, invest a, a small portion of the portfolio. That was a decline at that time. Um, there were a number of issues, as Kate said, um, Prime, our consultant since 2008. Um, their understanding and their analysis and their due diligence of NHCLF has evolved. And so that now, as she said, um, it's recommended for the, for the right investor, mm -hmm. right? Um, so in 2015, uh, when we actually established the ESG pool with about a million dollars, most of it had come over from one investor, one donor from the main pool. And so we we're ab actually able to uh, stand up a legitimate investment portfolio for the ESG sleeve. Um, during this whole period of time, talks with Divest UNH students and other students have um, continued, uh, and we continue to do that today. I mean, that mm -hmm. continues. We have many students interested in this uh, topic. It's really important to them. Um, in 2017, um, we were involved in the STARS um, uh, recalculation. We had done it in 2014, and UNH was categorized as a STARS gold um, participant. In 2017, we looked at it again, campus-wide, um, and looked at the I in particular looked at the investment portion of the STARS program. And if you're familiar with that at all, there are seven points out of 200 related to investments. In 2014, we had half a point. There's a lot of upside potential there. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, so from 2014, um, when, we, uh, when we approved the ESG uh, sleeve in the portfolio, um, we had obviously come a, lot of, a long way in terms of the thought process for our investment committee. Um, and so we were able to really move that forward. Um, the, let, me, let me just make a couple other points. Um, around the same time, uh, we had a conversation with a couple of our Divest UNH students. At the very end of that conversation, a couple of our board members and a couple of students, at the very end of that conversation, I think our students realized that divestment as an option was not going to happen. Our foundation board was simply not willing to take that approach. Um, at the end of that conversation, one of the students said, well, you know what would be really awesome? If you could just make a little bit of an investment in the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. It was like, huh? It just felt like it came out of left field. But the right people on the other side of the table were there. And we looked at each other and we said, hey, maybe we should. Maybe we should look into this. So we did. And we talked to Prime. And we got more information from them. And eventually, the decision was made to, to um, invest $3 million of the, of the university's portfolio in New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. Um, so I think I'll stop there and let John do a little talking. Um, yeah. But happy to take any questions for our experience. Great. And John, if you would, I guess, maybe just a brief overview of how the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund came to be and how it's structured, and then the impact that you're having in the New Hampshire community, but also the broader community. Great, certainly. And uh, first off, thank you, Eric, because I, I have seen the evolution of the conversation at UNH, and your leadership uh, really made a difference. And also, thank you, Kate for the advocacy that you did and the, your own learning and that evolution. Tremendously impactful, really. Um, good work. And uh, so I'm John Hamilton. And what you should know about me is I'm a <clears throat> social entrepreneur and practitioner. And I've been blessed to have the opportunity to work for the past 33 years looking for ways to get better at community-based economic development. 
and I actually started here in the neighborhoods of Dorchester, Dorchester uh, Community Development Corporation um, in 1985. And um, after a couple of stints here, I got inspired by the work that the Community Loan Fund was doing in New Hampshire, and then uh, migrated up to New Hampshire and have been doing a variety of things, including um, leading the New Hampshire Job Training Council, starting uh, an affordable housing development group, and leading the Workforce Opportunity Council. So I've had a, a breadth of opportunity. Uh, most recently, I came back to the Community Loan Fund in 2000 to lead the business investing, where we began to do mezzanine investing as an alternative to traditional equity for companies that have good growth potential to create better quality jobs. And more recently, have now become responsible for all the money out aspects um, of the community loan fund. So that's just my personal background. To get to the organization's background, think back to 1983. A little ways away, 35 mm -hmm. years ago, there was a group of citizens. So this is Live Here, Die in New Hampshire, remember. There was no act of government here. Um, a group of citizens got together and had a vision for a better New Hampshire. A New Hampshire where affordable housing was accessible, good quality childcare was available, and good jobs were available. And they had a core belief that people who face obstacles isn't always about a low income, it's sometimes about not having access to credit. And a second belief that when people with capital will make some of it available to meet basic human needs when there's a way to do so. And those are essentially the two core beliefs that was the catalyst behind the community loan fund starting in 1983. And thanks to the New Hampshire Channel Fund, we were incubated uh, in their basement. Um, and we've been going at it since. And I would say that the success that we've garnered is really because of our persistence, our creativity, and being there with building relationships to find ways to get capital to go to the places where it doesn't normally go. Getting capital to go where it doesn't normally go is our bread and butter. And so I'm going to illustrate that with two examples um, where we have really achieved some systemic change. And there are a lot of people in New Hampshire who live in manufactured housing parks. And the system's rigged against them. And this is a picture, I think this was Lilac Drive in Raymond, New Hampshire. In 1994, they were park number, I think, 25 when they closed. And this is the celebration after we financed them to own the land underneath their homes and become a resident-owned cooperative and all the pride and dignity and affordability that comes with that. Um, and I'm proud to say that um, this week, uh, on Friday, there should be the closing of a 125th resident-owned cooperative. Um, and we've also been able to make over 1,200 mortgages um, to these homeowners um, on their uh, homes, and with a default rate of 2.3%, proving, hopefully, to Fannie Mae and others that this market is viable. Um, so this is one example of our important work and is a way for 7,000 households who are low income to become homeowners. Um, a second systemic change that we've been working towards with our work is farm and food, building a more local food system in New Hampshire. This is a third generation uh, dairy farm in Kentucket uh, Creamery in New Hampshire, who unfortunately was trucking their milk halfway across the state into Maine. But now with a loan that we made, um, they now are building out a um, bottling plant and next month should begin to flow milk and get the locally sourced food so their value-add creamery um, can produce more value-add products with cheese and ice cream, which has a much different margin than directly selling as a commodity. And hopefully that means there will be a third generation uh, that will live on and thrive. So those are examples of our work how did this all happen? It's because we were able to mobilize capital. We actually had to mobilize $15 million this year, just this year alone, to keep up with the demand. So this is a picture of how we work in New Hampshire. It's a maple syrup bucket. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> and it's also how we, how we do this. We are blessed to have over 600 investors, many of whom are unaccredited, non-accredited as well as accredited investors 
but 600 investors who helped to make this work possible. And each of them have made a fixed income type investment into this one shared risk pool of $107 million of investor capital, which sits on top of some net assets that we've been able to garner thanks to one federal program and a lot of private investors matching that. Um, so the net assets um, bolster our work and together we've been able to deploy over about $273 million worth of capital. But each of those investors get a fixed income type return and similar to what Elise was, Elise was saying, those are market rate returns, just are hugely impactful. Um, and gaining anywhere from a one to 5% return Depends on, you know, longer you park your capital with us, the higher the return. I'm also very pleased to say that over 80% of our investors renew. Um, and I'm also really proud to say that whether it's deployed in our affordable housing, which represents about 85% of our capital deployment, or childcare or business finance, the borrowers work really, really hard to repay us. And because of that hard work, and also because the business education that we do, and quite frankly, that's a lot of this. That's our secret sauce right there. It's the business education, the technical assistance that we offer to set our borrowers up for success and to find real risk mitigants. That's what makes us successful. As a result of that hard work and that risk mitigation, our portfolio has less than 3.5% default rate. Uh, so, Eric, you said something really important, and that was really around the evolution of coming to an investment like the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. You know, as we think about Prime Buckles and our work, you know, we're set up to do research diligence and really understand and vet and monitor investments on a go-forward basis. But the other piece of that is really trying to figure out where they belong within client portfolios. And I think about the evolution in terms of where we were, you know, five years ago versus a couple of years ago um, when one of our foundation clients really pushed us to find a solution and to find a place for these types of investments. And and so that evolution was really important internally within the firm. It's very much a partnership that we've had with our clients. But nonetheless, it's a lot of work. And there are a lot of constituencies, particularly those of you who sit around uh, investment committee tables. There are a lot of different opinions and views. And so I wondered if you might spend just a little bit more time talking about how ultimately you were able to come to that investment. So um, as I said earlier, our investment committee about five years ago was, um, this was really not on anybody's radar screen in any significant way. Can you hear me? OK, thank you. Um, we've had some changes on our investment committee. And we've had um, uh, significant, significantly more receptivity to these types of uh, investments, um, ESG investments, impact investments. Um, at the same time, our fixed income portfolio was really not returning very much. Um, and so there was an opportunity here when we revisited the idea of the community loan fund investments to actually improve the return experience for our fixed income segment. And so we got into it. Um, and we got into it on the relatively shorter end of the spectrum. As John said, 1% to 5%. We're on the shorter end of that spectrum right now. I'm really hoping that we will eventually move out a little bit and continue to improve the um, return of this part of our portfolio. Um, but it made sense to our investment committee from just looking at it from a return perspective. And for our investment committee, and for most, that's the primary um, thing that they need, the primary bar that they need to jump over first before they get to, um, you know, considering the social impact of a particular investment. So it made a lot of sense to them, and everybody wants to do the right thing. It gave us an opportunity to do the right thing in New Hampshire, and UNH being a public institution, um, it's a very strong responsibility to the state of New Hampshire, and this was a way for us to, um, to help um, mm -hmm. solidify that as well. Great. And we want to make sure that you're all heard from as well. So to the degree you have any questions, um, happy to steal a mic. And you two no. can share that okay. one. Great. And my friend Michael over there has one too. Why don't you get that one right there? 
And just Hi. signal me if you want to ask a question. Mark Watson. That's good. Boston Impact Initiative. Um, I spent 35 years in the investment business, so two thirds in the traditional world and a third in the new world. And my question and frustration is, is why did new products come from the tr traditional architecture, the, the consultants, mm -hmm. uh, the investment boards? I can talk about CMOs, which blew up. I can talk about hedge funds, net of fees, which did not return. I can talk about structured loan products. I can talk about derivative products. All these came from the big, from mm -hmm. Wall Street and got pushed onto these committees. And everyone said yes. And then they underperformed from 2007 to 2013, mm -hmm. 2014. And then when we talk about mission-related products, which <laughs> germinate from the communities themselves and are mispriced with respect to risk, as, this, as John just talked about, all the arguments pop out of the woods. And mm -hmm. I, I, so my question is, what's the responsibility of the intermediaries and the us leading boards? I sit on some mm -hmm. foundation boards to actually correct um, the environment in which information is being delivered? I think that's a great question, and maybe I'll start. Um, you know, as we think about it, our Mission Alliance Investment Committee really started as a socially responsible back in the day um, task force about 10 years ago. Alice, who you saw earlier, who's with an intentional endowments network, myself and a couple other individuals within the firm really had a kind of budding interest in the space. And so um, had spent a lot of time, but not a lot of our investors had a really strong interest. And the global financial crisis happened, and it was really interesting, though we kept working in the area and we kept educating ourselves and getting to know um, those folks who are offering great product in the space and the types of investors that were investing in them, there wasn't a huge amount of demand, I would say, from kind of the endowment and foundation worlds. And so while we've had this infrastructure to really support and respond to that interest, um, what's interesting to me now is if I think about it, we're probably about 20 to 25 percent of our clients who have some component of, um, you know, mission aligned investment. But 80, 85 percent of our clients are having conversations around the table. And so I think, you know, there's some supply, but there's also that demand and kind of wanting to be responsive to, you know, the committee and to ultimately what the best thing for that organization is going to be. I think change is never easy, but I think it's also sometimes the younger generation that's bringing a different uh, appetite and different set of questions. I'm seeing it as we work with conservation groups around our farm food lending that increasingly environmentalism, it's not enough to create preservation of open space. The millennials are asking for working lands. They want to see farms and local food. So I think in the same way with investing, you know, it's not sufficient to invest. They want to see a local impact. So I think change happens. Sometimes it's the younger generation that gets to kick us in the butt and get our attention. That's a good point. Do we have a question right here? Hi there, Paul Herman from Hip Investor. Uh, so my nephew this morning was making a chart, which he called, uh, he didn't like to call it a pie chart. So now I can tell him about the bucket chart, <laughs> which is compelling and, uh, and memorable. So like I can remember what's on this chart. So fantastic. I'm curious on if fixed, it sounds like fixed income may be an on-ramp from a foundation and endowment perspective. Um, and so I'm curious about how that can accelerate. And I'm also curious, um, especially, John, since you've worked in so many different organizations, economic development associations don't really have uh, a lot of uh, demonstrable, measurable impact to report. So they have a demonstrable impact, but they're not reporting it. So how we can bridge that from what you're doing with them. Great. So in terms of the demonstrable impact, I do rise to that challenge of how to demonstrate that in a compelling way, which is, I think, a mixture of qualitative and quantitative data. Um, we have some. I would say that one of the areas that we are very interested in is quality of jobs. But when you define a quality job, it's like, and I've been asked this, it's like defining a quality child. 
it's tough. Uh, and, and yet, I think in every business that we've ever worked with, I can very much speak to the difference we made from the when we started the loan or investment and what the business was doing till the end. But it shows up in very customizable ways. The impact is not always one thing. And so I, I would ask for some flexibility. And when we're trying to aggregate the data and compare it across nation, nationwide, it loses a lot of meaning. Um, but I think we ought to be challenged, like you are, of how can we speak powerfully to the impact we're having. It's just a mixture of sort of how customized is that data. As was said earlier, um, you know, to get down to the root issue, it, it can get very specific and very impactful. But then how do you aggregate that up across your entire portfolio? It loses some of that meaning. So it's a balance. As it regards impact, I think I would just add, you know, this obviously is where we're spending a lot of the time today. As we think about some of the private funds out there, that's another area where we've seen a lot of change, a lot of new issues. The duration on those investments is very long, so I think it'll take a while for that to really build out. But it's encouraging. And then I think the other thing that we've seen is on the public side, that idea of public equity impact becoming more important. And you've asked a couple of questions about measurement. I think once we start being able to measure and speak to that, it really changes how we think about impact investing and what the relevant asset classes might be. In terms of the on-ramp aspect of your question, absolutely. And we've seen it both in terms of um, foundations who have a charitable giving um, that it's integrated relationship between investment and philanthropy. And in fact, when we receive an investment, if it's 100% of an investment and no philanthropy, we sort of go out of kilter. Because we're not FDIC insured. We need to raise that 20% of our capital needs to be. So we really celebrate when we get a, an investment where 20% of it comes as a gift. That allows us to grow and balance. And so that's one way of on-ramping. In terms of individual investors, Part of the on-ramp uh, leads towards co-investing outside the bucket. So they say, John, it's great. We love to invest in the community loan fund. But you know what? There are times where we've got this other pot of capital where we want a higher yield, and we want to directly invest in one particular business that you're investing in. And so what that does is it enables us to do deals that are larger than what would be appropriate for our portfolio. But we, we basically, about half our business deals in the last two or three years have been with co-investors. So we are able to s increase our impact, and they get this great you know, um, deal that's been vetted. Now, we're not a broker, so they have to do the due diligence, but they get to piggyback on the same deal that we structure, whether it's a debt deal, which is relatively low risk, but still outside the bucket, so it doesn't have the perfect track record that we've had with all of our investors. So I, I, maybe I didn't say that, but among the 600 investors over the 30 three years, not a single investor has ever taken a loss on any of the money they've invested in the community loan fund. And of course, knock on wood for all the lawyers in the room, there's past performance, no dictate of future performance. But those are the facts. And um, yeah. We uh, have one more question in the back that we'd like to. Oh, sorry. So I just want to pick up on this question of risk, because it feels like we have a theme here, which is people coming up and saying, you know, our investments are perceived as risky, but here's what the track record really is, or there's a misperceived, some aspect of that. And um, I am curious, Eric, maybe you can say what the difference was between when you looked at the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund and said no, and then five years later, you said yes. Was it a difference in your board just saying, we, we understand risk differently? Or was there actually less risk, or, or both? And then the same question to, to Prime Buchholz in terms of, um, is part of this just a scale question, right? There's inherent scale in smaller organizations. They don't have the same kind of inherent risk in terms of the way that they're structured or, or certain aspects? Or is there something that we as a community are just fundamentally missing? Um, which was sort of the question that was asked before. But mm -hmm. OK, so I'll address the first question. Um, what changed? So um, I wasn't at the foundation when I, this is hearsay from my perspective. But um, I was told that one of the reasons, one of the key reasons was that this was not an insured product. Um, 
I think uh, the, the board, the investment committee and Prime's understanding and sort of comfort with, um, with this product um, has evolved. And so there was a willingness to want to say yes, whereas I think before it was, there was not a willingness to say yes. On our end, I think part of it was really wanting to find a good fit. Um, and so it wasn't that we had looked at the community loan fund and decided it was overly risky or that we were you know, full stop uncomfortable with it. It was more trying to understand when we put the work together where it was going to end up. Um, and so what was interesting for us is really in partnership with other community members, other um, organizations, we really dug in and did our diligence, but it really took one of our clients trying to figure out, okay, we are really interested, how can we fit this into the portfolio? And so it was really that partnership and a dialogue that went back and forth that you know, prompted us to really spend the time. But it, it wasn't a question of risk, per se. Um, you know, the diversification was there. The level of diligence is comparable on the mission side as across all of our traditional investments. Um, you know, that hadn't changed. It really was where it was going to fit and how it was going to fit within portfolios.